I'm Joel Berkowitz, New England Regional Director of the American Technion Society. I'm in Danvers, Massachusetts with Dr. Bernard Gordon, who's the CEO, Chairman of the Board of Neurologica Corporation, and was the founder and former Chairman of the Board of Analogic. Uh, leadership development in systems engineering has been a key interest of Bernie's for all his professional career, and Aviv Rosen from Technion has asked Bernie to discuss with you a couple of issues regarding systems leadership that includes how is it possible to identify future leaders among young engineers, how is it possible to educate and train students and young engineers to become leaders in engineering, how important is the multidisciplinary approach in the design of modern engineering systems, what have been the major challenges and changes in engineering during the last 20 years, and what are the major changes and challenges of engineering that he expects in the coming years, and to do all that in 15 minutes. Bernie, it's all yours. Well, th thank you, Joel. Uh, I think that those are a lot of questions to, to answer uh, comp comprehensively in 15 minutes, but I'll do my best. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to thank you and the audience and the society for making me a honorary member uh, and I, I will cherish that thought. Uh, I think first I'd like to state that there may be a difference in the definition of system engineer. To, uh, to me, what I believe what you at the Technion call system engineering, in former days I would have preferred to call project engineer. And the project engineer would be a person of very broad education, would know a number of different disciplines, even though other individuals might be more profound in their knowledge of each individual discipline, and would have a personality that understood the nature of the people, nature and the needs of the people reporting to the system engineer or project engineer and have an energy level such that one could cope with the problems that will inevitably arise. Uh, in recent years, particularly I think in the United States, people have said you're asking for too much. That's too much to expect in one person. Uh, my, my own view on that uh, matter, I think, was formulated when I was a young person and became a Navy officer during the, during the big war and understood that, A, if I was in charge of something, I was in charge, even though other people had subcharges that it was my job to look to the success of the people reporting to me and that they came first. And that is not a common thought today, uh, particularly in societies where everybody has led a fairly easy life when they were younger. So I think I don't necessarily recall the sequence of your questions, but uh, one question is how do we go about identifying somebody who might be a leader. And a lot of people, I don't think, like the answer to that question. Part of it is the way they walk, and the way they talk, and their look in the, or the gleam in their eye. Uh, I know many, many highly intelligent, highly educated people who don't have that gleam in their eye, who want to be the center of attention. So we need to look for people who are liable to be disciplined, as well as have an eye, a high IQ, and who are capable of ingesting a broad education. 
that covers mathematics, physics, electronics, uh, uh, hydraulics, etc., uh, etc. Et and that's not every one. Now, a program has been set up at MIT in the last couple of years, uh, which program does in fact bear my name, where they have a whittling down process of identification. And they start in the freshman year with a program for everyone who enters the engineering program. And then they whittle that down by about a factor of five. And by the fourth year, they have whittled it down from nearly a thousand people to 30. And they are the ones that complete the program and then go off into the real world to become engineers. Another uh, a factor I think that needs to be considered is how much experience does an engineer need to have in general, with some exceptions, before they actually can be a leader. Now, I'm fairly old and therefore believe some of the things that I was taught when I was younger. And when I was younger, uh, my first job after having two degrees from MIT and uh, having been an officer in the Navy was to design at the Eckert Mockley Computer Company a circuit that consisted of two diodes and a resistor. And then I designed something more complicated. And then I designed the acoustic memory of the Univac. And then I went on step by step to do more and more complicated things. And in the latter years, could do very complicated things based on the summation of the experiences, the integral of the experiences. Today, I think many academics believe that they can have a program and a kid will go through school and the day he or she gets out, they should be able to run a complex engineering program without ever having the experiences and the disasters that occur in engineering and learning about the real life and tolerances and so forth. Uh, so I, I think uh, other points I'd like to make, I think it's very important for the would-be leader uh, to be encouraged to go through the apprenticeship and take the various steps necessary such as you have to do in the military. I mean, you don't come out of West Point or the equivalent in Israel and become a general. First you got to be a second lieutenant, and then you got to be a first lieutenant, and then you have to be a captain and so forth, and it's a long way to being a big time boss. But I think a lot of people today, uh, particularly those concentrating on computer science, think that the education they're going to get in college is going to be the, the most important education they're going to get when it's really only the beginning. Uh, Joel, can you refresh my memory and give me another question? Yes, I can. Um, how is it possible to educate and train students and young engineers to become leaders in engineering? You also mentioned the multidisciplinary approach. And what are the major challenges and changes in engineering? And what do you see the ones coming ahead? Okay, well. A lot of people will debate whether you can teach somebody to be a leader. I think you can train people to enhance their leadership potential. I think you can inculcate certain attitudes, but not in everyone. Uh, so I think the, the, the process, such as they're doing at MIT, of whittling them down year by year is, is an important one. And I, I think uh, what, what schools are increasingly trying to do is to bring about uh, groups of students working together uh, with probably in each group people taking turns to act as the leader and having a serious penalty for failure in the projects that are assigned to them. 
I think uh, many, many schools today uh, literally teach that failure is a wonderful thing. And I always answer by saying, not if you're a fighter pilot. And so the idea of competition is an important factor in technical leadership. I think what a lot of people, uh, particularly uh, academically oriented people, don't always fully understand is that at every stage in history and technology, there comes a time when something new can be done. And when that time comes, more than one group of people have had the idea to do it. Let, let me give an example. I, I've gotten a lot of awards and medals for, quote, inventing the analog to digital, high-speed analog to digital converter, or more specifically, the signal processing capable analog to digital converter around 1954. I had had experience at the Eckert Markley Computer Company where I did a lot of digital circuit work. I had gotten involved in my next company in radar and I decided to build an A to D converter. But there are two factors that are significant. One is if I hadn't done it in that year, somebody else would have done it the next year. But it's even worse. And that is that somebody actually did it the year before. Not at some high speed, but on a military contract on the West Coast for use aircraft, a gentleman had built a device for a missile, but it was classified secret. And so we both invented it, but he did it first. <laughs> and if I hadn't done it second, somebody else would have done it that, after that. So the, my point I want to make with this tale is that, again, at any time there's competition to gain a result. And many academic institutions, I think, denigrate competition. I have heard people that are leading technical institutions say, if everybody is smart, how can somebody be the leader? How can the leader, if somebody is the leader, then that denigrates the other smart people. It's been my experience, particularly on large engineering jobs, that the average level of capability is not superior. And that everybody has what I call a screw-up rate. Some people screw up every day, and you can't tolerate it them. Some people screw up once a week, some people screw up once a month, including the boss. And so everybody needs to be reviewed and sampled using the equivalent of the Nyquist criteria that you got to sample at twice the highest frequency there. You need to sample and control at twice the perceived screw up rate of the people reporting to you. Much to my amazement, the local leading technical institution has adapted that thought after considerable debate. So leadership involves taking the burden on yourself, recognizing that the people reporting to you have skills but limitations, making up for those limitations without their knowing it, uh, by bringing forth uh, help for them to succeed, giving the credit to them, to your own, uh, uh, so that instead of yourself. And then you find that uh, uh, the people that you've led, that you've brought to success, will look forward to you leading them again. Freddie, I want to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. I also want to thank you for your support of the Gordon Center for Leadership Education at Technion, which I believe is dealing with many of the issues that, that you discussed as um, Israelis have a different uh, background in their history um, than uh, many, many in, here in the United States. But thank you once again, and we thank you all for listening to us this morning today. Thank you, Joe.